Hello everyone and welcome to this video. I'm super excited to share this video with you, which is not a normal video, which you could already tell based upon the length of it. It's actually an interview and even a part of an interview that I gave to Ilya Taxer. Ilya Taxer is a wonderful pianist. He lives with his wife Daria, who's also a wonderful pianist in Canada. They both are building um, a great YouTube channel, I think, that has the potential of reaching a lot of people. There's a link here to their channel in the info card and in the description box. And what is great is that Ilya reached out to me from a very healthy perspective, I think. He and his wife have a wonderful class. They are teaching high level students from all over the world and they are not particularly teaching them in the way we advocate on this channel. But nevertheless, that, that I would say mainstream performance practice world reached out the hand to me to say, hey, we have to talk. We are intrigued by what you're doing. Also, we want to know the historical truth. How did Beethoven play? How did Chopin play? What did these people have in mind? Not to say that at the end, if we understand and maybe accept that, that is the historical truth, that we are going to apply that in our own practice or in our teaching practice. That's something else, but at least we have, we must have the courage or the will to together understand, to together go there, to have this journey together of understanding the historical truth. And so he reached out to me, asking me for this interview, for this conversation, with the question also if it was okay for him to touch upon any subject that he would like to touch upon. And I said, okay. There are no conditions, of course not. And so we had this conversation, this interview, which was great. Ilya turned out to be a great moderator for this interview. And I had, we both, I think, had the feeling that we had a wonderful evening. And literally an evening it was. The interview uh, lasted two and a half, three hours. So we decided to divide that in two parts. One part is published on Ilya's channel. Again, you can access that interview by just clicking on the info card here on the link in the description box. And if you go there, do subscribe to their channel, say hello in the comment section from our community to theirs. And the second part is published here. You can watch both parts independently. You can go over there, uh, over do their channel first for the first part, or you can do it in, whenever, in, in which order you want. It doesn't matter. We went over every aspect you can imagine and that makes me happy because these two interviews together, they actually form, they give you a very good picture of what we are doing, of the philosophy of this moment. So Ilya, thank you for bringing that to the surface, for asking the right questions, for setting the right mood to create a wonderful conversation. And certainly if you knew here those two parts together, would give you a wonderful start to join us here on this journey on temporary construction and much more than temporary construction because temporary construction is just a foundation of the musical performance that is built up on that change because changing tempo is changing everything. So I hope you have a wonderful time in the experienced hands, I would say, of Ilya Daxer. What do we do? Um, that's not true. To the metronome. Tick, 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 tick. Stop, stop, stop. Yeah. Beethoven was freaking out. Brilliant and fast. Because I've been there. Let's talk a little bit about the Romantic era. Time when, when the metronome actually was 
uh, demonstrated for the first time. And uh, um, uh, how did people react to this? Well, that's what we perhaps today do not realize anymore. We, we started by saying like many people today hate just the metronome because of, you know, reminiscences to our piano lessons. And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But back in the days, uh, the top composers were euphoric. They embraced this machine with everything they had. Of course, yeah. on top of, of the list is Beethoven. Beethoven, Beethoven had the plan of metronomizing his entire work. He didn't do that, but he gave a lot of metronome numbers, string quartets, symphonies, they were all published in 1817. Yeah. Um, yeah. Of course, Melzo was a brilliant marketeer. He used modern marketing technology because he, he, he went for important people, influencers, we would call them today, to get testimonials, we would get, say today. So he went to Kramer, mm -hmm. Salieri, Beethoven, Spohr, you name it. So, but people were, I wouldn't say desperately, they were looking for a machine that would give or would end the confusion for performances of their works. Because imagine, we, 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 we've shared it or we said it before, we live in a time where the professional musician is not longer a composer and a performer. So Beethoven is one of the first who composed in a way you could say he presented the world with a finished score. Mm -hmm. He was one of the first who said, I actually don't want you to add anything in my score. When Czerny, very young still, with his father came and he played the Waldstein Sonata, um, from, from paper and he played other, other uh, sonatas by memory. Beethoven said the guy is really, really good, but uh, playing from memory, mm, yeah, but make sure that he doesn't skip any of my remarks. He wanted to have everything there. Mozart was a different time. You yeah. improvised a little bit in his works if you, if you played it. But in Beethoven's time, there you had a finished score, which was going to be performed by other musicians. Mm -hmm. So that's part of the reason that composers were embracing this metronome. They would, they would make a statue for it at that time. So let's make no mistake about it. The metronome was a huge thing. It's exploded. So finally, uh, uh, Winkel or, uh, or Mezel? So Mezel was a machine inventor. So he invented a lot of uh, crazy stuff. Mm -hmm. um, part of the problems with Beethoven was the composition he made for his uh, orchestra, unlike his, his own automaton, as the people say in the days, there were famous things. Not only him, he was part of, um, I mean, people made amazing stuff. Mm -hmm. But he made a chronometer before, which had problems. And I don't know much about the chronometer, but it was presented already to Beethoven in 1812, 1813. And then Melzo presented this idea in uh, Amsterdam, I think, on, on, on the exhibition. And there he met Winkel. And Winkel had solved the problem, I think, or the clock. Mm -hmm. It's technical. But Melzo saw the machine and he basically copied it, copied it and, uh, and went. And patent, yeah. yeah. Patent, yeah. Patent, yeah. So he won well. Melzo, let's say. <laughs> okay, fine. Fine. So, um, would you connect, would you link the, 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 the tempo increase uh, to um, beginning of, uh, I would say, professional conservatories era? Uh, which, which uh, yeah, so you, you think um, as, as soon as uh, um, people were gathered in the, uh, in the same place and basically uh, um, aiming the, the, the same goals to become a professional musician, then we can we can notice that the tempo and, and speed basically started to increase, right? Of course, we speak in general. Yeah, there were a lot of differences in terms of quality in that time. Yeah, but in you general, know, you could say that people, the musicians who were considered to be the top of the top of the top, mm -hmm. I think when you go, when we could go back to a performance of 1840, mm -hmm. that would already be surprisingly fast in many instances. So okay. it was an evolution that went like boom and suddenly. However, you, you insist that Chopin, which we, we all think that, the, that, that it was a brilliant pianist and, and, and the writing um, exclusively, you know, uh, brilliant uh, uh, compositions, you think that he, he played uh, much slower than, than, than we, we do today? 
Well, yeah, sure. That there is no doubt about this. I mean, Chopin was not Chopin. What the Chopin we have created in our minds mm -hmm. was not the Chopin who actually actually lived. He was not of the, one of the most. Uh, well, was not. He was not. I mean, he was not considered to be a virtuoso pianist in his days compared to the to the to the Liszt's and to the to the what I had you Hansel and and all these these guys and and Talbeck. Mm -hmm. um, I, the other days I was reading in Clara Schumann's diary, 1835, he visited the Schumanns in Leipzig, I think, where they were at the time. Um, and Schu uh, Clara describes he played a nocturne, barely noticeable that he touched the piano, uh, the sound, I mean, and he said, she said, it's, it's, it's heartbreaking, but he had to use his power of his entire body to play one forte chord because he was so sick and so weak. Mm -hmm. And that's the Chopin, of which people like Trifonov say, you know, probably his fourth finger was longer than usual. That's the reason why he could play all this stuff. No, he couldn't. Mm -hmm. When Liszt played his etudes, Chopin wrote, I, I wish I could play it like this guy, side reading my stuff. It mm -hmm. was literal. Liszt was outperforming Chopin by a lot. I mean, yet, if you ask Heine, the German poet, who was a friend of, of, of Chopin, who is the best pianist, Liszt or Thalberg? He would say Chopin because he had a certain sensibility in his playing. He was he could play incredibly soft. Mm -hmm. He could play these ornam the, the, these these ornaments in a way very few people could like very natural. And, and what what Moshe is also was describing that uh, his passages were incredibly colorful and even sounding. Also, he must have been an amazing pianist. But mm -hmm. to say that he was a virtuoso compared to Liszt, I mean, just take etudes by Kalbran and Hertz, Liszt, Talbeck, and compare them to Chopin etudes, and suddenly Chopin etudes feel like very medium level music. Mm -hmm. We have made something out of that 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 music in the time hadn't, because we have speed, sped up this music incredibly so much that it mm -hmm. becomes almost unplayable. So what I really would love to see, uh, uh, it's, not a it's not a request, it's just my, my own desire. Um, I really would love to, to hear maybe one day you, you making a review of uh, Chopin etude number two, Opus 25. Um, because, uh, you know, what, what I hear and what I, what I see today in, in, in discussion of, 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 about this etude, it's so far from, from actually what's written in the scores, yeah. starting from the speed and ending up with the matching those quarter triplets versus eight notes triplets in presto tempo. And, and, and uh, uh, basically today, if, the, if you, you chase a speed, you play just eight notes versus quarters. That's it. Yeah. Tara, para, 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 para. It's, yeah. it, doesn't, it doesn't have any more the, the sense of tara papara ta tara papa ta ta the, 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 of triplets. And yeah. I think actually this is a great example. Uh, and maybe one day if, uh, um, if, if you will decide to, to, to make uh, just a video about, let's say, five, uh, five the most ridiculous, you know, mis misconnecting. The, the scores and, and and just making kind of review of what what's going on to, uh, today uh, and 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 what's actually is written in scores and it's a very interesting question why we why do we ignore this um, and I, I I heard so many master classes you know uh, uh, about Chopin etudes and I, I I would say that eighty five to ninety percent of of master classes which I was attending and when when professors were, were talking about this etude either they, they were not very clear about it or they were saying you know what just play my own tune just just by by eight notes tara 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 because uh, he said because everyone is is, is doing this today so th yeah. this, is, this is interesting right uh, so you know when when you take something out of its context so much let's imagine for a moment that what we think about the metronome music is right, that Chopin's music was played differently. Mm -hmm. So when you take something out of context so much, it's no surprise that you will have to face and solve a lot of problems. That's mm -hmm. just one. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the Opus 10 number two, the A minor with the, with the chromatic lines. I mean, have you ever seen the manuscript of this? 
I think managed, so. Yeah. Have you still made in Warsaw when he was 19? He doesn't give 16 notes in the second and first thing. He gives quarter notes. So you have to hold the quarter notes. I mean, mm. you have to solve a lot of problems that one, you restore this, what we think is the historical use of the metronome, fall into place. I mean, Chopin, don't quote me wrong, it will be not for every pianist. Eh? He was far above the average level. He was not Mr. Nobody. Mm. I was just saying he is not the Franz Liszt and the, the, the Thalberg of his time. He couldn't do that physically. Mm -hmm. So his music represents that. But I mean, uh, the octave etude and other etudes, will, even in whole beat, will not be for everyone. That's what people sometimes think, that when you play this, this theory, everything, everything becomes so laughably easy. Mm -hmm. It's not. Let's go mm -hmm. to the Hammerklavier Sonata for a moment. That's not something you can sight read in that tempo. Mm -hmm. But yeah, problems you will have to solve on a lot of fields. Fingering. No one is talking about historical fingerings. Mm -hmm. um, pedaling. Who is ever talking about Chopin's pedaling? Yeah, on paper. But who is doing it? Mm -hmm. The reason for that is also Beethoven. Eh? Beethoven, of course, in his first period, that's, that's different, but his later period is so clearly indicated. He indicates pedal where he wants it. Mm -hmm. But if you go to speed up music that much, you live by the grace of the, by, of the pedal because you haven't got time to just mm -hmm. make it individual tone quality. The pedal is, you go out of the key and the pedal serves for certain sound. So yeah, Chopin is, is, is it's, I don't know, it, it's his music, it's his, it, he was a legend in his time, of course, his music was so well, in Vienna at the time in the 30s, no one, no one cared about Mendelssohn and all that, just Chopin. So it's one of the composers we will dive into next year a lot. We hope to restore a little pianino, which is a play of upright piano of 1838, mm -hmm. which he loved playing. He didn't, he preferred the, the upright little piano before the grand. And then we're going to start to doing doing all this, That's, all this work and all beat. Yeah. Sounds 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 great. Sounds great. Remember, we 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 had one conversation before off camera, just just a short meeting, and I ask you uh, uh, why you think that metronome was used uh, only in a single way. So, like only let's say uh, when 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 you when you count uh, subdivision of notes, not not a single bit. So they they basically. Yeah. Hold um why i'm asking this because first of all i think that if if uh, um um if a, a, a man a, a person he if he's not spoiled by the inventions in, in general you know no microwaves no no stoves no no fridge no nothing no cell phones uh, uh and then he he received this kind of toy you know in his hands then then uh, why would, would would he stick to one particular method of using this uh, uh, exclusively? Why it was not uh, um, used in, in in many different ways? For example, um, for whole beat and for single beat as, uh, uh, as well. And another question: Since we started to talk about Chopin, don't you think that this time, because he he was uh, uh, he was born in um, uh, eighteen ten. Mm -hmm. And then during his life, he, he was not lo uh, uh, living long line, life. But however, if that was the exact moment when, when speed started to increase dramatically, don't you think that uh, because he, he was also uh, um, motivated to sell his, sell his compositions and, and, and basically promote himself, don't you think that he was following this path somehow? And uh, let's say from the early opuses, maybe, you can you can uh, find many evidence of, of playing um, uh, his music in a whole beat. Uh, however, his let's say last uh, composition, last years. Don't you think that uh, that uh, sounds at, at least sounds more convincing, better in in a, in a uh, single beat uh, um, uh, interpretations? Yeah, well, Chopin abandoned the metronome at a certain moment in his life, I think even in the 30s. So for his later works, we don't have metronomizations anymore. As for instance, for Liszt, we have almost nothing. Brahms, we have almost nothing. So mm -hmm. um, that's an interesting question. I think there is a, there is a certain truth in that, but we, that we can never really reconstruct because we weren't there. Mm -hmm. To say that 
he made an evolution or composers made an evolution to a certain tempo understanding that goes beyond any understanding of notation. That's something I cannot believe. And you don't see that reflected in the pieces we have metronome numbers from. Also, if we see metronomizations by, uh, by Mertke, a German guy, or Kulak, Jeremy student of works of Chopin, mm -hmm. which are unbelievably similar. That's one of the remarkable things as well, that you see metronome numbers throughout whole Europe made for similar works. Independently from each other, they are very close to each other. That, yeah, if you could apply their single beat, that would be unplayable or just make no sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and if you apply the whole bit there, then, then you get another picture. Um, to answer your, your first question, I wish it were so black and white, but it wasn't. The single beat use or the modern use of the metronome was always a thing. It's not that there was only whole beat. The 19th century, however, if you would say very generally from a bird's angle perspective again, let's say 85% of the music is with metronome numbers wasn't whole beat. That's actually what yeah. you see. There was a portion of music that doubtlessly must have been a single beat mm -hmm. very early on. For instance, Vincent Novello, the famous uh, publisher still exists, I think. He went in the 1820s to Salzburg to meet uh, the sister of Mozart just six months before she died and to, to Constance in Vienna to talk about Mozart's music. And he published as a first one in England in his new uh, uh, edition, the Mozart and Haydn masses, masses, just to make sure that they didn't disappear because they weren't printed then. His metronome numbers, if you compare those to the metronomization, for instance, that Hummel, a new Mozart student, gave to orchestral works and chamber music, they are about in the ratio or of one to two. Mm -hmm. and now, people will say, yeah, but cham chamber music was known to be faster than church music. Okay. We were still talking about the same notation system, notation that didn't change that much. And I can, I can acknowledge, I mean, I can accept that church music was a little slower, but not like this, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. exactly like this. So this went on the church music, Deutsches um, Requiem of Brahms. I, have, I cannot say for 100%, but my feeling is that might be just single beat as well. If you see the notation, very long notes, applying the whole beat system there would say, okay, that, that would become totally out of scope of everything. Mm -hmm. So you had this double system, Griffin Carroll, organ works of Bach. I think it's single beat. How no, you know that the, uh, the pianist 50 was a compare those metronome marks with Czerny, exactly one to two. Czerny has doubled the speed of Hano. You yeah. must have known that. I wish I could find the letters of Hano, which was a mysterious guy. He didn't publish in Paris. He had his own publishing company in somewhere in France. And but why did he give 108 quarter note where, where Jeremy gave 108 half note? So, and then you come in the early 20th century where some strange things happen, which we cannot explain. I mean, the, I'm working together with Lorenz Guardian. You might not know this book, but that's that's the person who is actually doing all yeah, the research. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We're writing together a new book. Um, that he's he's writing all the theoretical parts. But then you have some stories, and then like for instance, Max Regen, he wrote a lot of piano music, but he's primarily known for his organ works. So very complex music, which was always premiered not by him but by Karl Straube, the organist in Leipzig. They work together. Mm -hmm. Regis metronome numbers are double those of Straube who published uh, instruction editions at the same time mm -hmm. and not exactly double, about double. So Straube gave his own metronome numbers for Regis works and they match about, which is an interesting part. He just didn't have them. He gave his own metronome numbers one to two. Never one word of discussion between the two, the two always words of approval by Reger. And then after 18, uh, 20, uh, 1917, Reger started republishing all the works and he also halved his metronome number suddenly without explanation. And then you come in the twenties and the thirties where uh, publishing houses were editing and just publishing Regis works and they reached out to organists studying with Karl Straube still 
to ask explanation about the metronome mark. So there must have been a period in which there was absolutely no interest in metronomization whatsoever or metronome mark, and they somehow didn't understand the system anymore. Mm -hmm. Of course, we went through two world wars in Europe. I mean, a lot changed. But if you ask me, can you today on the I am recording it the 22nd of May 2020, give a clear reconstruction of how people perceive the metronome, how they used it, when, I cannot. The only thing I can say, if you do not accept the existence of whole beats as an historical used metronome use, then you have to reject the majority of 19th century tempo indications. You see, if you say that uh, approximately 80 to 85 like percent of music was written in, in, in a whole beat system and some portion of music was written in a single beat, then today we, I mean, the, the society, com uh, music, music, musical, of course, the society completely uh, rejects the existence of, of, of whole beats. Uh, uh, what surprised me the, the most, actually, after I will be asking you how you're dealing with, with those people, but uh, uh, here's some of my experiences. Very often we, we just go for uh, for concerts. Sometimes it's uh, baroque uh, um, uh, societies or like uh, people playing on historical on period instruments. They are not reconstructing the tempo. They're playing as fast. That, so basically they're doing exactly the same things what what's happening on the main stage of classical music but on the period instruments that's the, what, what they do my question do you communicate them anyhow yeah that's 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 a topic on its own of course um my understanding of early music is today that the, the movement as we know it kind and that's i mean it's a bold statement i know but i'm making it anyway it has come to an end because if you want to, I mean, the early music movement started basically not in the 60s, you would think that, but of course they were staged so much and there were still recording companies that promoted these guys so much in the 60s and 70s. And basically that was the boom period of the early music movement. You couldn't think of anything too crazy to bring it on stage. And people would say, yes, yes, we're going to experiment with music. And so surprisingly or not, what happened is that certainly there came a moment certain, at a certain point where these people who were still considered today as pioneers, they were invited to become teachers in conservatories, um, have orchestras connected to concert halls, and suddenly you had a second generation, third generation, I'm actually third generation early music adept, I would say, my, my teacher Jacques Van Oetmessel was one of the pioneers as well, maybe second generation already. So, but we all play in our teacher's system. And I remember Jacques Van Oortmes, my organ teacher, was a brilliant man. He passed away too soon. He said to me, the great danger of the early music movement is that we are teaching these people, young musicians, with our knowledge, and they will not go beyond our knowledge anymore. You have to go back and question our generation. But today, if you play the Hamaklavia Sonata for the first time ever in history, eh? And I didn't do that, Alberto did that. You were going to interview him as well, I think. Mm -hmm. In a system where you can say, okay, I don't agree with your theory, but the metronome is actually picking with our playing. So it is a solution. And then you see people say, reject that so fiercely, as an, even as an experiment. Mm -hmm. Then I say, okay, but then the early music movement has stopped to exist because that's the nature of it. We need to question ourselves. We need to find a solution. And what is the other solution? So we can debate about the solution, but we shouldn't be debating about play that music differently. We should embrace that. And I have to say, I think personally that I've always wondered, and this is something that happened when I was still studying in Amsterdam. I wrote articles on tempo. I, I, I mean, there was an internet. We live by the grace of YouTube today. It is our platform. We create this island and everybody who wants to come on board, welcome. I really, we are having more and more musicians that come on board. And at the end, I should take a long break and everything should move forward anyways. It's not about me. Mm -hmm. But I saw from the 90s, like even talking about tempo, those articles weren't published. And 
I grant those people that maybe my articles back then were not scientific enough, but there was not a rejection based upon the quality of my articles because of, of but because of the idea. And still today, it's for so many people who have a position so hard to say, you know what, I come on board with you and we're just going to play. We have in next Monday, so we have the premiere of the trio opus uh, 38 of Beethoven with one of the most famous clarinet players in Europe who says, I don't care, I'm just coming on board because I want to experiment with this way, which gives me a lot more freedom. He's still playing Beethoven in his way, of course, in the way that, that's, that's the duality we live in, we live in today, but at the minimum, we should come to a, to a scene, to, to an acceptance of this as an experiment at the minimum. And then, and then we, can, we can go and just play music and no longer have to defend our option. That's, that would be cool. That would be, I wouldn't say a victory because we don't think strategically like that, but that is actually what we go for, that we create this island and people say, those are the whole beaters. We know that great guys, great musicians, we love their music but we have also the old early music and we have the Steinway people, that would be cool. I think it's very important to clarify that you're not arguing that the tradition of the modern piano playing. I remember uh, during our first conversation, you said that, that, that you see two pianos in my studio and you're surprised that I'm so open to, uh, to try, but I don't see reasons why, why don't we try? I mean, I'm, striving to, I, I'm dying to, to ask my, my, my students to play slower because I want them to shape uh, uh, music in, 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 in the right way. So for me, as for, for teacher, even if, if this theory uh, will be not proven like 100%, it's still very, uh, very correct thing to do. So you're right, if it's experiment, but I think that on your, on your channel, people really don't uh, don't see that you, you're talking, talking about the experiments. I think that they, they, might, they might feel that you actually criticize them for playing uh, uh, music by, by Beethoven or Mozart incorrectly. This is probably what, what's... Uh, but that's, also, that's also inevitable because yeah. you can, you're totally, totally cool with the idea that there might have been historically another way of playing Beethoven. Mm. But what it really means but if, I, if we are right, and again, what's the other solution? I would be very happy to see the metronome number you can divide by two in a subdivision or, or just have a modern reading. Mm -hmm. What you actually are doing, or what I am doing, even if I would only play the Waldstein Sonata in the way I think it is without explanation, would be exactly the same. I would say to people, listen, you can do whatever you want and continue playing like you want to play. But from this moment onwards, you know that what, the way you are playing Beethoven is the way people played Beethoven in 1817. It's not 70. It's not the way he had his works in mind. And that's the reason why people sometimes are freaking out. Because we have the idea that we honor the composer. Mm -hmm. But if you really think about it, when was the last time you were really serious about anything in the score? And from the, from the first moment, you would say, this is something I cannot solve totally rethink. We're not living in that system. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of musicians and that's maybe off topic a little bit, but it's important because it's related to that as well. I know musicians who would die to come on board, but they're not allowed. Young musicians who still have to go to a conservatory. Can you imagine no, someone going to... In this system, uh, it, it, it's not possible. It's, it's actually clear. You know what? Uh, you know, I've always been uh, studying at, at, at different music schools, uh, conservatories, and I know how the system actually already limit you from, yeah. from all the way. The force to, to play the same etudes over and over again, okay. and of course they expect to hear them in temp in tempi which they I mean which is traditional for for our contemporary era. I mean, the so, only yeah. thing people are in conservatories still concerned about. I mean, I've been there too. Yeah. Um, I remember my, my again my teacher Jacques van Ortmes, he had a huge influence on me and I, you could say I may be doing his work further he said always he wanted to be questioned and if he didn't know an answer he said I don't know I mm -hmm. don't know so but imagine Alberto would do his entrance examination playing the Hammerklavier Sonat Fugue in half beat 
So in, in whole bit, I would say. And people would be astonished and start to yell at him, of course, because the Hamad like is not, how dare you of the beginning. And he would say, okay, sit at the piano and do it in your way. I mean, that would be the end of a discussion. Yeah. Why? Because all those teachers and the majority is, I mean, I cannot blame them for that, but it's a system which we actually also wanted to discuss that those teachers wouldn't have an answer to him mm -hmm. because they couldn't play that. Who can play the Hamaklavia Sonata and single beat? No one. Although people claim that they can, but they cannot. And secondly, if he gives a solution, he would be rejected for the solution. And that's something I can understand right now, but it's also a pain point in our system because what are we actually teaching people? Are we teaching players to play as fast as possible, which is a way of doing. You yeah. could say, okay, you come in a conservatory and we want you to play as fast as possible so that later you can play everything you want in your way. That I could understand. But now there is this, this aura around that there is also the tradition that we want to have that goes back to Beethoven. And that's of course what people are freaking out as, as we said before. Yeah. If I come with this statement like, hey guys, but this, is, this has to be like that then I'm hitting the system like from this angle. And I can do my best to smile, to bring my dog Sibo in the videos like Alberto is doing actually, and to be as positive and joyful as if the message will remain the same. If this is true, then the whole system collapses. Mm -hmm. And I think only for a short moment, because what you will see then, imagine, imagine that someone with a lot of influence tomorrow would give an interview and say, hey, this wind winters there in Belgium, what he says, I don't think it's nonsense. Okay, mm -hmm. let's, assu let's assume this all whole bit concept is accepted then, after that, the imaginary world. The conservatory system would go on like it does today. Only we would know that there is another world that we might not learn in the conservatory, which is going back in time. Mm -hmm. So being relaxed about all of this is what I would love to do. And what we certainly try to on the channel also, we, we are serious about what we do. If I say historical temple reconstruction, it's nothing more than that. It's a reconstruction of an historical temple. It, I'm not saying it's the only one, but I claim that and people are freaking out even for that claim, but I'm not giving an inch there because that's exactly what I believe in. That's what I do. Yeah. But and and you you definitely have right, you know, to, to, to claim things which, which you're uh, uh, sure about. I mean, because I feel actually the reason of this interview is to, um, first of all, to spread this information as, as far as, as, as we can and uh, keep this conversation, this dialogue going. For, from my understanding, uh, for example, for uh, um, Dr. Levin, whom I, I admire a lot for, for what he's doing in, in, in uh, uh, Mozart um, uh, researches, for, uh, for, for instance. Uh, why, why don't we just ask him directly? Why, why don't we contact him and make this kind of you know, conversation and, and, uh, and ask him questions? Uh, because even for me, his playing is, is, is fast. I, I'm playing slower. Uh, on, on, on piano that yeah. he's playing then he's playing sonatas uh, uh, on, on harpsichord and this and this is a very interesting topic uh, it's a matter for, for for discussion to my opinion and another uh, reason why why i decided to 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 make this interview and you know uh, i meet many pianists and many teachers and that's exactly what you just said that most of them, I would say, it's it's actually I'm scared to to pronounce this uh, number, but almost 85, 90 percent of them just relying to the information they receive from the teachers yeah. instead of opening a book or opening a manuscript and and do research, they their own. You know, at the same time, they they they're so um, sure and they're so. Um, you know, firm about their their uh, uh, traditional 
uh, way of performance. So basically, I just I just would like to uh, um, remind all young musicians: you have many choices. It's, it's not necessary. You, you you must stick to what your teacher said. You uh, yes, you have to be always polite. And actually, uh, even in case with Alberto, yeah, uh, I think he has a wonderful opportunity to learn music by Ravel, by Rachmaninoff, by Debussy, by by new school i would say when, when the, the tempo is not is not the question there is no place for someone like alberto if he comes here he kind of drinks everything i say to him and i don't see myself as a great teacher but he says i am because mm -hmm. he says there's nowhere in the world i can learn the things like you play partly because i'm i was trained as an organist and from that and i may take a lot of different stuff for pianists i can see that and i've played this way like my own you know, long period of my life so this generation has to fall in line with mm -hmm. the conservatory system in order to get their paper that they can teach later. And so that's a fundamental problem because he doesn't want that. Perhaps he wants to play modern music, I don't know, but he wants to play like this. And there is no way, you're not, accept, you're, you're not allowed to do that. So that is a fundamental problem. On an academical level, I would say, that's even a, a more fundamental problem because do we have a problem or not? Mm -hmm. Even pointing to the facts in an open question format, are we having a problem or not is too much for many pe people. We have a solution for everything. That's the answer of the system. Mm -hmm. we don't. And what we do as a system, as a society, as you say, many people just rejected that first hearing without going into detail. They reject it as a principle of rejection it's like you talk to their fear system, to their crocodile brain, that is just refusing to hear it. Like children, I don't want to hear it. But we don't have a solution. So if on an academic level, we pretend to be on that level, also as conservatories or universities, we want a solution, we would have to find a solution that works for everything. And there comes this strange guy first, of course, this guy of, 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 of Switzerland, who say, yeah, but if we do this, just this little thing here, we go this far and everything falls in place. And then the, the world says today, we don't want to hear of it. We stick to the problem. And that's fundamentally, I, could, I would say, playing music, you do whatever you want. Beethoven is not here to complain anymore. But on an academic level, that's fundamentally wrong. An academical person, a scholar, should find solutions for problems and not reject possible solutions as a principle because it are not only YouTubers who freak out and the comment section, you know, that's the thing of the online social platform that I hate. It gives people the, the impression that just by able, by the possibility of typing in a comment, they are somehow a voice that you should uh, recognize. But on an academic level, we should think, I think, be more honest in the fact, you know what? It doesn't work. I saw an interview of Norrington. I mean, Sir Norrington is one of the first, most important, I would say, advocates for the modern reading of the metronome to Beethoven's music. He recorded all symphonies in tempo. I, I'm not doing this on accident. He gave an interview for a young musician where he was laughing, what, like, of course, we can play it, you just do your best. I mean, what can be so obvious as playing it? And then for a local radio station in Germany, of which he probably never thought that they would put it online 10 years later, he was asked, uh, Mr. Norrington, you claim to play all the movements in Beethoven's tempo, also the eighth symphony, last movement. And you know what he replied? He said, I cannot, can you? You know what, Norrington, it's all a joke. I mean, if you come to this point, how can I stay neutral and say, mm -hmm. you know what? It's okay that the Norringtons and the gardeners go out there and like also Andras Schiff goes out on a big stage and say, if you don't, cannot play this piece and laughing with people who would play it slower. Mm -hmm. And so many people are influenced by their authority that they actually misuse. And then you go into detail and say, hey, Norrington, you're not playing 17 notes a second with your orchestra. Why not? Because he cannot. Mm -hmm. And of course, you come to a point that if you want to make your point, 
you cannot sit down and say, you know what, we are all colleagues. Let's pretend that we are all in here together because we are not. Mm -hmm. People will try and actively try to make this message unheard. And so you have to hide in your voice. There will be a video uh, soon about Andras Schiff, which I respect enormously as a musician. He plays clavichord too. But he goes on stage and makes the case for Yohamad Lagusen not to be on I me. Mean, what's wrong with this metronome number? And then he demonstrates the first few bars. Why is he saying that 138 is the right tempo while he already recorded the piece in 104? Mm -hmm. If you are honest to your audience, you go on stage and you say, I don't know. I think it's too fast. Mm -hmm. And so there is, it's so difficult. And I know what you're saying and I'm hearing you. It's so difficult if you want to, if you care about this message, not only for the composers, but also for these young guys who are in conservatories where I hear today they hire professional uh, uh, physicists to, to, to cure injuries from practicing, mm -hmm. to free those that generation from that, I mean, come on, to, mm -hmm. to have joy in their music, to unchain them from that. If I want or not, this becomes a movement and a movement needs a strong voice. And sometimes I finger point to things that are not correct. So yeah, also Norrington will, will come on the channel with this quote. And if he would be honest, I think he's in his eighties now, he would say, okay, I'll give you an answer. I actually didn't know what I was doing there. I didn't know this and I didn't know the solution. Mm -hmm. And let's think about this together. But I don't see that happen very soon. So we have to defend ourselves sometimes a little bit. That's simple. So, uh, um, I I make all right, okay, yeah, 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 absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Um, so, next part of our interview, um, I decided to call it five questions. I will ask you to name, for example, five reasons or five books or whatever. Um, we will we'll see now. So the first question is, why you decided to make your YouTube channel? First was the reason of having a beautiful clavichord that I was playing a lot. And I was, I cannot complain about the concerts that I played at the beginning years, but you know how it is, people have got you. And then of course, I was playing so much more music that you play and it disappears. And then I thought, I thought, well, my camera can record the video. I mean, it was 2014. We think now on YouTube as a big, of course, YouTube is there, but in 2014, Mm -hmm. Still early. I mean, I was a little bit too late actually, but it's still early. I said, what well, if I would record this and just publish it on YouTube, what would happen? I just did that for myself to rebuild the library of content that these recordings or these performances didn't just vanish in air. Mm -hmm. And then I, you, you start to get some comments back and some questions. And before you know it, you are building actually a community around the idea of the clavichord at the beginning. It's also not a topic without, it, it has some provocative elements in that as well. Mm -hmm. um, well, and then this evolves to the possibility, you know, this the piano that I have right now, I have two now, an original one, 1825 and a new one. I wanted to have that for so long because even when I was 16, 17 years, I wanted to play Beethoven. It was my main thing. The clavichord I bought for Bach, but went straight to Beethoven, Mozart and, and Beethoven as well. But I was thinking like, okay, knowing Lorenz Guardian actually for a longer time, if I'm going to play the Waldstein in this temple, I will have to give an explanation because at best people will say, that's a crazy guy, Glenn Gold like crazy, doing his own stuff without any theoretical background. And it's of course, historically nonsense, but of, yeah, okay, let the guy play. And I didn't want that to happen because there was a lot of thought process that goes into this. And I decided a certain moment, 2017, when Lorenz visited our place, you know what, let's go all in on this and present this, this, this background to, this theoretical background to the world. And that was the, actually the birth of, uh, of the channel as we know it today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so 
but maybe not five reasons, but that's the main reason. That's, uh, and today, of course, it's my voice and I want to give it to many, as many people as I, as we can. So yeah, yeah, you're a good, good community. Uh, and, and of course, people rely on you actually. And they, they, they're written, you know, one, one thing about your, your, your channel uh, makes me feel very upset. Can I share with you? Yeah, sure. Yes. Because you closed your vlog about reading. And reading in what, what sense? Uh, uh, remember, you had like six, year, six years ago, you launched a new uh, chapter uh, on your channel when you were talking about the books, about what, okay. what, what musicians are supposed to read. And I think, to my opinion, maybe it's a good time to uh, relaunch it again. Because actually, my, my next question. And this is address to uh, my colleagues, but also to, to, to students and to young musicians. Could you please name uh, five or so um, the most important books which every musician is supposed to uh, know? That's an excellent question. And it's, for me, very hard to answer because it depends on what your interest is i'm reading less than i should it's of course the nature of thing now alberto is doing a lot of editing on the channel mm -hmm. so i'm be freeing my time to write the book together with lorenz and my task i mean we shouldn't we don't have to go to in detail i'm not writing the theoretical chapters i will write actually the chapters that surround his work but that you could read as a musician you can imagine his work is very theoretical and very, it's, it's, it's in German, like it will be translated in English, but so punctual. I would say, you know what, there is another entrance gate. I'm a musician too, and I'll give you my view on everything and come on with me and I guide you through the book. That's actually my, my task. So I'm reading more than I did before. What I particularly like to read is original content. If I would have one suggestion for young students or young people or any, any musician, is if you want to read the biography, it's fine. But it's an interpretation already. Go on, on IMSLP, on archive.org. We have so much material there. I mean, in the 90s, when I was studying Chopin, I had this one book, uh, Alberto has it now, by Algeldinger, Chopin, vu par ses élèves. So Chopin, seen by by his students. It was the only thing we had. And I, I, if I page through that book, I see in the, in the bibliography, all these things that as exclamation mark, I want to have it, I want to have it. But today, I just type in the title and I have it. So go and read original stuff, the diaries, letters, uh, three ties, go and read Jeremy's three ties, it's great. I mean, the guy has just, he wrote in, in, a piano three ties in 1839. And there has nothing been done afterwards because a long period, because everything was in there. Mm -hmm. And if you read it today, think about it. I always see it like this. Imagine Czerny would tomorrow give a lecture on piano playing. He would basically say the same stuff as is in this book. So listen to the guy, he's speaking to us. Mm -hmm. Unfiltered, which is difficult because it's another context. Mm -hmm. It's not black and white. You don't find the solutions there, but you will feel so inspired. And if you go to bed after reading that book for three hours, your head will be spinning. What, what does he mean with that? What does he mean with that? And then you read Chopin's letters. You say, oh, he's talking about the same thing as I read in Moshe's diary. Would so, there be so, something? Yeah, it doesn't mean that it, it's going to help to, to, to put these puzzles together, right? It's that. I see it as a gigantic picture and we have little pieces mm -hmm. of the puzzle. And every time you have one piece and you say, I figured this out. And then you take the piece and you put it on the board and you, you go back and say, does it make sense, this picture? What would it represent? And if the piece of the puzzle doesn't work, you take it off and you give it another interpretation and you put it back. Mm -hmm. And that's the great thing about this whole big thing. It's so incredibly coherent. You take a piece of fingering, Czerny, Chopin fingering. I mean, if you would study with Chopin, do you really think you could stick to your own fingering? Of course not. I don't think so, yeah. He would, he would, he would hate you, I think. Um, so there you have the information. Does it work? Can you play those pedal indication? Does your instrument hold your back? Um, is it because you play on a Steinway or a modern piano? Would it be helpful to just go to 
a flail and just experiment, um, I can give you the answer. The difficulties will be, will be the same. So you figure it out until you say, oh, but now I have something. This, now I can play this piece without pedal and it works great. What did I have to do for that? Release my hand different out of the key. My legato touch is different. I cannot play legato anymore as I'm being taught to play because I cannot use finger substitutions anymore because Chopin didn't use it as much as we do today. Mm -hmm. So what do you have to give up? What do you get in response? And then reading this original stuff where, where there is nothing that will help you directly. But if you do that for a while, you will feel that you have, you're laying a foundation of that you can rely upon, you can test for yourself. Mm -hmm. And that's so exciting. So that's the bottom line of what we do. It's so super exciting to just experiment with all the baggage from the table. Everything is new all the time again. And that's the great thing I learned from my teacher, Dr. Notmesson. Question yourself every day. Go sit on a chair for 10 minutes and question everything you believe in. Challenge yourself every day. Mm -hmm. That's so helpful. It, it also prevents you from just being too hard in your own bubble. You know, we all have that. I get telephone calls with Lorenz where you say, no, I found a new sword. And then, really? You look at it. And so you challenge your, each other, but you challenge yourself. And the only thing you need to have is the courage to step out of the system because it will very quickly force you to think differently and say, oh, but it doesn't work anymore. I'm going to experiment like that. And so, yeah, if you are that far, every one of your viewers, your our platform is here for you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you. Uh, another another question will be uh, uh, about modern musicians. Who would you highlight and and why? And and second question, uh, which recordings would you uh, recommend to to listen? So I have to start with maybe disappoint you. I do not listen that often to music for the reason that. You have to be aware that once you're across the line, once you are practicing in this, I would say whole beat system, but it's not that. It's just it, the bottom underneath that is an awareness of harmonic changes, of uh, notes, of articulation, of accentuation. Once you see how this fits, it starts to make sense. There is no way back. You start, uh, if, I are, if, if I say I admire Andra Schiff because I say that because he is a great musician. I would never play like him, but I would also never be able to play like him. I mean, come on, what has this guy played in his life? Who am I to even think about challenging him? That's not my point. But can I listen to his Beethoven recording? No, never, ever, ever again. I'm sorry, I cannot. And that's, that sounds much, it's very hard. But if I listen to modern recordings of Beethoven, I see like these old movements playing back in the wrong speed. And my mind is like, stop, 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 stop. You're in. I cannot follow what you're saying. Because I've been there. I, I know what these notes are talking, are speaking. And they rush over this, like in a rhythmical impulse. And before I know it, I'm, I'm totally lost. So I don't listen that much to modern piano players. But if I would have to pick one recording and to take with me on a desert island, let's, let's make it a little bit more specific. Mm -hmm. That would be the, the last uh, Goldberg variation by Glenn Gold, by, by far. Mm -hmm. I mean, Gold, who starts there, the beginning aria, the first note, only the timing from the first to the second note, he builds up an entire imperium there. And by the way, that aria that he plays so much slower than most people play it today is exactly Czerny's tempo in whole beat. And that, I don't know if he experienced, experienced with that as his appassionata, the scandal recording is exactly Czerny in whole beat as his Mozart uh, a, dual, uh, a major sonata beginning, exactly Czerny in whole beat as is a la turca, is exactly Czerny. You know, this yeah. Glenn Gold is for me a, a, a phenomenon. It's, it's unbelievable. Even when he plays very fast, it, I, can, I can understand every note. And that's the thing. He doesn't play fast for playing fast or just because of tradition. He gives meaning to every note. 
Mm -hmm. And it gives always the impression to, I can double the speed if I would like to. So it's always something more. Whereas more many recordings today you have the feeling that they are hitting the ceiling. Mm -hmm. Him never. But am I listening a lot to Glenn Gold? No. I'm I'm not I mean I have a huge collection in vinyl recordings, but I'm I should make more time to listen to 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 to, to those recordings. Because there are some interesting things also in older recordings of Bach, like the old Leipzig Kantorei. Uh, even uh, Kittel, I have it on my channel, 18, 1928 or something, uh, 1940s, 1950s, those recordings, they have still a lot of the tradition that goes way back uh, over the 19th century. But that's, that's a whole other topic. So yeah, correct. Uh, correct. So a few sentences ago, you, 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 you said that Mm, uh, that uh, Glenn Gould was uh, playing in slow tempo uh, without uh, uh, much historical, you know, digging into the uh, uh, into the topic. Uh, uh, I have to defend, you know, because he's can we, we we are Canadians, you know. I have to defend him <laughs> because to my to my feeling and to my uh, at least what I know about about Glenn Gould, actually he was making recordings and maybe. That's the, the yeah. case, and maybe that that's why he was uh, he was playing I'm differently from from, from 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 all um, uh, uh, musicians. So I, I like about him that he really was not he he he, he never cared, you know, about uh, uh, and that's actually what is very important uh, for for a musician um, and scientist to be uh, as I said. Previously, to be respectful, but to be independent. Exactly. So, if I say I cannot listen to Schiff's Beethoven, mm -hmm. I'm not saying he plays it bad. Mm -hmm. In his view, this is a brilliant performance. I mean, come on, of course. Mm -hmm. But if you have been on the other side, you start seeing that this is like the playback speed is, is wrong. So, but that's hard then. Eh? If I want to come up to my channel, for instance, the, the Nocturne in D-flat major, Chopin, everybody plays this exactly in how whole bit, not about, huh? exactly. Mm -hmm. If I make the point on the channel, it will be felt like, oh, you're criticizing those people. No, no, but we have to use the material we have. On the other side, if you are as a musician, make a performance or a recording, that's a statement as well. So it's sometimes hard to avoid you know, the provocation there, you know, as hard as I try. But Glenn Gold, yeah, it's amazing. I, I give you one crazy example. When Alberto was here the first time, how people, I would be very interested in, in the fact to know if Glenn Gold was researching metronome marks. I, 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 maybe, maybe not. But if you are open for this reconstruction idea, then some strange things sometimes happen. For instance, again, Alberto was here the first time. And I said to him, um, he went, of course, to the era, which was, um, yeah, it's a beautiful piano. And I said, uh, did you play Chopin? Yeah, I played it above. Okay, we put on the, um, the preludes. And I had the Kulak metronome numbers in my hands. I said, give me your estimate tempo. And so here you had a young guy who was open for the idea. He is very flexible in understanding what needs to be understood and how to get his notation. He feels that. Mm -hmm. And he matched, he matched Kulak in 70% of the cases. Not about exact. And that's the thing what happens. It's so many times just spot on. And so I'm, I'm so conf confident that when you open yourself for this idea and you play a little while like that, you will very naturally come to a normal understanding again of those historical tempi. They're not, they're not gone, they're still here. But what, 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 what you just said, that for you, basically, this, this door was closed. I mean, uh, the, the door to the, to the new uh, traditions, let's call it like that. So uh, since you started to, to play more in, in, in a whole beat uh, um, way, then basically it's it's or or maybe i maybe i understood you wrong maybe what you're saying that you can't listen let's say to other shift and modern things playing 
classical composers. Yeah. Uh, maybe maybe what, what 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 you meant because yeah, sure. uh, my 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 point and my question why uh, let's say people are supposed to take take a look and decide for for themselves um, about the whole hobby theory that is just uh, bringing us more more solutions and more opportunities. Especially, I mean, we we're so selfish. Uh, of course, I mean, I can I can handle the most of the piano repertoire, uh, Brahms variations, and it's yes, we've been trained. But what about music lovers who never uh, uh, spend uh, ten hours a day as I did when I was fifteen, for example? Then 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 what? Then they have to chase our tempi and and be as uns unsuccessful for the entire life, right? Or they they could they they, they have another option. So. Um, my okay. my point about uh, learning and, and be being open to to these theories um, that you just basically receive more more options, but I disagree to uh, deny uh, uh, the, the, the the new tradition because I uh, I don't want, for example, to 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 lose um, um, opportunity to to to, to play um, Brahms. And, and play uh, Ravel and play Debussy and play uh, Rachmaninoff, of course, in in in, fa in a fast speed because I can, you know, and and why why, why not? Mm. And that's the thing. Imagine, and we we live in a world tomorrow where people would say, okay, we accept this. Let's say, yeah, what is the other solution? Beethoven, Chopin, you name it. We accept this. Then it's your decision to play differently. The only thing you the world should be. Uh, acknowledged to, or just uh, accustomed to, I would say, is the fact that if you play Beethoven still in that way, mm -hmm. you're playing it in, the, in an industrial, post-industrial way. I mean, industrial by the yeah. age. But, yeah. And that will be something strange to get accustomed to. But once that's done, then you have several options. Mm -hmm. um, for me, personal, that would be something, from the moment I knew this was kind of and I knew this from my, my 20th, I mean, in Amsterdam, even I had so much trouble with my piano teacher over this, that there was no other solution. I saw the connection also with organ music. It was one day when I had a piano lesson, Mozart Sonata, I went to, uh, to the organ class with the trio sonata of Bach, and I was suddenly realizing how this notation is the same. These guys didn't live so much apart from each other, and yet I'm playing so much different tempo. So from that moment on, I thought, I thought, well, if that's not what Mozart had in mind, then for me, personal, that's not an option anymore to even try to play differently mm -hmm. because I want to honor his music. And I know that was always my, my mantra, so to say, if you had to choose between a million performances and you could choose Mozart's, which one would you choose? Yeah. Probably in his mind, the music would sound the best. So, but that's for me. Mm -hmm. That shouldn't be the case for you. That doesn't have to be the case for you. It's only this idea of acceptance. Do we accept that there is actually another framework? I mean, I'm not saying that you have to play the Waldstein in 88 exactly. You can play it 92, you can play it 76. You cannot play it 136 because then you're taking it outside the scope and you're changing the idea. That I think people have to accept one day and that will be hard. Mm -hmm. Because it's something, eh? if you play Beethoven, so not imagine you're practicing Beethoven tomorrow and you accept this idea 100%. It will be difficult to do it differently because that's Beethoven. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. About, yes, I, I don't, I don't really understand, especially if, you, if you're actively performing. So it, it should be either, I mean, uh, like on the plane, you know, either you, you're having fish, either chicken. You know? uh, yeah. no, no one will give you both at the same time. Uh, I, I've tried. So, um, well, uh, you said you had hard times with your your teachers. Um, would you would, would you tell us something about about this? If it's if it's not 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 too personal, maybe uh, um, uh, on, uh, using your experience, some young musicians also will, uh, will 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 try to find a way, and we will see the 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 um, you know uh, options how how they can solve it or how they can avoid. Yeah. It. yeah. Well, yeah, my experience was, of course, in a way unique because I, 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 I played organ and piano at the same time in Amsterdam Conservatory. Um, and Jacques van Oortmes, and he died three or five years ago, I should say, almost five years ago. Mm -hmm. 
who became a good friend also, but he was one of the, the, uh, the, of the teachers for the early music department. I mean, he had full classes every year, so he was an authority within the conservatory. And I was, as I have, as I, I knew that at the time, but I, I mean, I was one of his better students, let's say it like that. Mm -hmm. So when I started my piano uh, lessons uh, as a main instrument in the second year of, of the third year of my conservatory time, I was just doing what every, everybody else did. I had a great teacher who happened to study in Poland. And the strange thing is, if you studied in Poland, you are somehow by default as Chopin. Um, you know everything about Chopin. So I was not questioning this, but then suddenly I had this Mozart Bach moment and at the same time, we had this temple symposium in Amsterdam, where one of the first advocates for a kind of whole beat theory, that's Willem Retzetaltsma, he was there after being in Spain for so many, so long. So I, I had a great chance to meet him and to, to work with in this temple symposium. And for me, things fell in place because I was playing in the organ class. You cannot play on an historical organ, Bach and the Tempe pianists play in him because the organ has lungs. They cannot breathe that fast. So you need to, and certainly historical organs. So for me, there was no other choice than to, hey, weren't we supposed to honor the composer? And certainly I was part of the early music department. I needed to reconstruct that. But there was with one like in the modern mainstream piano department as well, which was a kind of unique situation. And so I started to ask questions to my teacher. And yeah, of course, my piano teacher was not open for this. He started to debunk me uh, all these things and um, you know if you're 20 or 21 or 22 you, you you want to change the world and that's the thing that some teachers should acknowledge more I think because that's a great thing um, being challenged by your students is and that's something I miss I would die to have a class of students who challenge me every day and I would challenge them too um, but this was not the case here it was fallen line and I had to just forget about it, but I didn't. So there came this moment where I actually, yeah, having lessons was no, no longer an option. And he started, let's call it this long enough, he started to really do nasty things. I was also, of course, uh, in a teaching uh, diploma that I needed to have. So I needed to teach to, to, to students and to, uh, to write something, a script. And he was holding all of that back because he was in charge with that. It was, was payback time. Oh. And then I remember one time I told this to Jacques Canut and I said, listen, I have troubles in my piano class. I actually fear to go to my final examination. And I came with him in the conservatory. I still remember that as the day of yesterday. We were, we were heading to the canteen, so to, to drink something. And then my piano teacher came in the same hallway. And he said literally like this with his finger point, I need to talk to you right now. And he said to me, Wim, you go to the canteen already and after that, my problems were solved. I changed uh, the piano teacher and that was it. But, uh, yeah, so yeah. That, that probably was happening uh, uh, in about 90s or, or 80s, right? In the 90s, yeah, 90s yeah, yeah. or something like that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, now I think now, now I think you, 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 you could solve this problem. I was provocative. Eh? I mean, mm -hmm. don't see, I, I challenged my piano teacher till the, I mean, I wrote this, my scription, I went to, I mean, today we can print, but I, this is what's my description, right? Like, you know, and here is a chapter. This is all about teaching. And it was a chapter, Chopin and the Speed of the Post Coach. I mean, we, we're speaking now 1995. Mm -hmm. And I compared Czerny, Opus uh, Piano Part School, with Chopin's Etudes, which is unbelievable. It's like Chopin used Czerny's method, which of course he did. Mm -hmm. And I just gave the correlations there. And my deduction was, of course, based upon tempo that we have to do something different. And I remember as the day of yesterday that we have this jury, I had to present description and I have to defend it. And of course, the, 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 the thing about the, uh, the teaching thing was over. And then my piano teacher said, and now I have some questions about Chopin. He was clearly wanted to destroy me. Like, once and for all in front of like the most important piano teacher of, of mm -hmm. the Netherlands there. Yeah. But I was so prepared and I won it. I just, I just asked questions back and say, what is your answer for this and this and this? And he started to stutter. And there was one teacher, which was Willem Brons, a great 
pianist and more open for this, he started to laugh. And of course, he didn't like that. So I was, I was a little bit more provocative than maybe the average student. Mm -hmm. But there was a time perhaps also, and it was maybe also me. I mean, that's certainly not the right approach. But on the other hand, I come back to my point earlier. Mm -hmm. Students should challenge their teachers all the time. Hmm. If you don't know it, just say mm -hmm. that. Yes. It's so great when Jacques Canot said to me, we might not know this. And I remember one day when I had made a fingering of, of a D minor prelude and fugue, which is quite complex part piece for organ. Mm -hmm. And he said, how are you doing that? And I said, yeah, that's how you taught me to do that. He said, that's brilliant. May I, may I make a copy? Of course, not with a cell phone, didn't exist. He wrote it down. For me, this was like my teacher. That's actually... That That's actually something. very, yeah, it's a very unique and, and very rare thing, you know, when, 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 uh, when, when, when teachers are um, um, open, actually, to, to the musical, to the reasonable musical suggestions, I would say. Uh, I think so, it's all about self-confidence. Uh, so, yeah. the big names, let's say, um, Robert Levin or, or, or uh, Schiff or, uh, I don't know, or Sokolov or whoever. To my understanding, as, as, as I said in, in the beginning, um, it doesn't cross and doesn't conflict with their heritage. So they always can say, you know what? This music was, uh, even Beethoven was played, I mean, the pieces by Beethoven was performed in the uh, end of 19th century, was performed fast. So yes, I, I, I assume that, that, that Beethoven would, would, would play it slower, but but anyhow, you know our our tradition, which we can you know, at least we can um, uh, find the evidence uh, uh, by the audio recordings now on, on YouTube. So so many things available. Uh, this recording by by Brahms, you know, who is playing basically li literally in tempo of UJ1. I know that you're a little bit skeptic about about the recording methods and and speed. However, I think it's pretty much relevant and. We have many recordings of Liszt students, uh, starting, let's say, from the uh, beginning of 20th century, um, which are absolutely extraordinary, definitely. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Now, the question yeah. I would use is, as a teacher, what, does this, what, what, do, what do these recordings of Liszt students say about Liszt's playing? Huh. It, it, it's interesting. Um, you so, that it's one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah, but you, you, you really think that, let's say, I mean, I will, I, I will, I will tell you um, my, my feeling about how students rely and how they stick to the, their teachers' um, traditions. It's a really big thing, you know. You really think that, let's say, a least student um, would just uh, easily ignore his teacher uh, uh, recommendations. No. I'm not saying that. I'm saying there are a lot of variables in this context reconstruction that we might just not see. Mm -hmm. Who says that Liszt was teaching these, this new generation of musicians in the way he was taught or he played? Um, I can totally see a context with Liszt who was not, as in German they say, a Schnellspieler. He was not one of the, those who played Beethoven fast. He was known for his slow Beethoven performances. And there, is, there are some fascinating stories. And I think in general, the least Wagner tradition today in musicology is, is seen as kind of destroyers of the original Beethoven tradition, because what musicologists say today is that Liszt and Wagner later just played everything slower and had a great influence, big influence on German conducting style. I think it's totally the opposite they were playing according to the tradition and all the others was changing, but we can go into detail if you want. But if you, if you have seen ever this fascinating script read, read by this, this talking by Lamont on his list lesson, everybody knows that I think, where he says in the, uh, in the uh, Polonaise, where you have the octaves, yop, pop, 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 and at least interrupted the student and said, I'm not interested in hearing you how play you can fast octaves. I want to see the Polish cavalry over the top hills. And then Lamont so clearly 
suggesting there that the student, we have to have an interesting context. The list has a student who plays Chopin way too fast. That's what he says. Okay, but um, those metronome marks are even faster. But I, anyways, mm -hmm. gave the remark, play it slower. And then how does Lamont play? Mm -hmm. Does he play slow? No. Yet, Liszt, he made the remark that Liszt plays slower. That's actually a whole, his whole story. You will never find a pianist, a, a student, quoting a teacher saying, hey, you have to play faster, you idiot. It's always about you play too fast. And so imagine Liszt, such an authority. First of all, what does it mean to be a student of Liszt? Did you have one lesson, two lessons? We think that's like today, five years in conservatory. No, no, it's three, four lessons. They just passed Liszt and they were student of Liszt. Not saying that it is, means nothing. But there you are, Liszt. And imagine that Liszt didn't play too fast in the old tradition. Mm. He was, by the way, not playing anymore in public. Are you going to teach a complete new generation in the way people played in the 1820s, knowing that you live in a time where these people have to perform like the real virtuosos? Yeah, I understand, I understand your, your point. So However, there are a lot of variables in this reconstruction. We cannot just say, okay, we hear Lamont play, he was a student of Liszt, so Liszt played like that, Liszt was a student of Czerny, Czerny, and Beethoven. we have it. <laughs> yeah. It was so I think, simple. I think, I think that's, that's exactly the logic, actually, of, of, the, of, the, of the modern, uh, of the recent musicians. That, 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 that's I am playing like Bach, because my teacher, Jacques van Noordmes, he was a student of marie claire Allain. He was he was a student of Charles Marie, of Paul Dupré, Vidor, um, Lemmis, Hesse, Bach. And then you come back, go from Bach to Scheidemann to, to Böhm and to, ba to, 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 to Swirling. And I'm actually playing exactly like Swirling in the 16th, 17th century. I mean, it doesn't make sense. I still remember, and people don't realize that. Two things. Just go to those recordings of the 1930s. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have recordings of those people. Are we still playing like those people? By far, no. They use more rubato, they are much freer, they have a different use of pedal. Yet we claim that those people played like people 100 years ago where they didn't have recordings from. So it doesn't make sense to mm -hmm. just say this equals that equals that. And then the bottom line is, what are you wanting to prove then? I mean, in general, we are having these discussions in the framework of the metronome problems, but you can claim that you have been a student by did, by did, by did, your tradition goes way back, but mm -hmm. doesn't solve the metronomic problem. They're yeah. still there. So I don't see, I, I think those early performances recordings are very valuable, certainly if it are acoustical performances, all the piano rolls I'm very skeptical about. I don't know, but I would like to know more about it. I remember recently we had a Greek recording of the uh, um, uh, so just a digital recording of the uh, Birgin Suite number one, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and there was kind of outrage, how dare you? But there was someone, and it's a pity that he didn't comment, like he had a huge collection of piano rolls, and he said, Greek made these rolls with, with his name, like I approve the temple. And he said, I'm going, going to do some research and I'm coming back because this is nonsense. But he didn't come back. Mm -hmm. I don't know what happened. Huh? I would, I would, I will reach out, out to these people because I think that these piano rolls can be manipulated a lot. They were recorded. They were then by an engineer just improved that the wrong notes were, were, were away. And then many of those piano rolls don't have speed indications. So if we record those or if speed indications were set later, Ravel magically plays his Pavane in 54 to the quarter note that happens to be his metronome number four uh, for the Pavana orchestration. Mm -hmm. Why doesn't he play 80 for the quarter note, which has the piano uh, mm -hmm. piece? How can you explain that he went from quarter note 80 to quarter note 54? You see, there are so many problems that we cannot just say, we ignore all that. It's, Diving it's, into the context is so complex. That's it's, all about, it's all because of Mezzo. Why, why, did, why did he give us a metronome? I mean, 
people were living fine without it. Like, what's oh, no, that's not true. Beethoven was freaking out. I mean, Beethoven, if, if, if he met someone who went to a concert with his music, his first question was, how are my temples? Mm -hmm. And he, he published the Ninth Symphony, or the Hammerklavier Sonata, he sent to his publisher, wait for the metronome marks, you will need them. He says in the same letter, my Ninth Symphony was a huge success in Berlin. I think that because of the metronome number. So those composers, they were just so meticulously writing what they wanted and they want to have you play that exactly in their tempi. You know, it's not of course, like- Of course that was, that was sarcasm. I, I, I hope you understand, I mean. <laughs> yeah, but, but you frame something that many people think. Yeah. Today, it's like when Beethoven would return, he would be fine with everything. No, no, of course not. When you Did enter Chopin's class, you would be hit if you say that you practice 10 hours a day. You, famous outburst of Chopin to one of his students to say he played, a, I think the C major etude by memory. And he said, listen, Mr. Chopin had been practicing three hours a day last week. And he was out, how dare you play my music more than just a little a day? Play scales, but don't practice my music. I mean, those things should make you think about how they were thinking about their music. Yeah. So, yeah. Oh yes, oh yes. Uh, th this this time is is very far far back in my uh, uh, history, you know, in, in my background. Uh, now, yeah, now I'm closer to to what, what Chopin recommended. I play a little bit. So I think we have to somehow jump to the conclusion, and maybe it, it would be great uh, um, if you will make certain suggestions or, or a recommendation from winters to our listeners. It can be related to anything, to practicing, to listening, to, to general approach. Uh, maybe you just will say, be safe, stay relaxed and, 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 and all that. Anyway, I'm just giving you time and, and please uh, approach to our listeners and wish them um, and recommend them what you think is important. What I would recommend for everyone just sit down at your piano, take a score, take your metronome and just play. And if you do so, do one thing. Don't try to solve the problem when you are playing. Make up your mind before. If you say, I want to just give this a chance, say to yourself, okay, for the next week, I'm going to play this piece. Take Czerny's Opus 299 if you want, or just take a Beethoven piece. Um, or take, take a Mozart piece and the journey metronome, it doesn't matter. But act as if this was historically correct. In other words, imagine that this was the historical correct tempo and you as a musician had to make it work. And see after a week where you are. And I think that's the only way of coming closer to understanding this whole problem and being relaxed about it, that's, that's, the, that's the main advice I can yeah. give. Because from that point, your journey starts. And if that means that you have to, like Massimiliano, the clarinet player, he in this orchestra he still plays like in mainstream, but he, he doesn't have a voice there to choose. But he has now this other direction. And he says in the video and the interview we have published, I will explore both ways, but this thing, the whole beat way is for me, it's important. And it feels like schizophrenic sometimes, I can imagine. Mm -hmm. But that's where we live in the times. We can, you can separate those. And that would be great if, if, if many of your viewers would just do that and in a relaxed way. We should embrace each other. And if you come to Belgium, you get a Belgian beer from me. It's always in the refrigerator. You can give Sibu a hug. And then we go to the piano. We just make some fun. Because that's, 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 that's sounds this. Sounds just fabulous. Uh, yeah. Please. I would like to thank you for amazing conversation and uh, uh, there's really a lot of things to think, uh, to think about. And I would like to ask uh, um, our listeners, uh, whoever is watching this um, uh, conversation, please don't forget to uh, smash the subscribe button for both channels for the authentic sound. Please make sure that you watch uh, um, videos which Wim is, is doing because you you may like or dislike or you may you may have different point of view but at least you need to acknowledge 
what this person is doing. He's spending his time. He's, I, I, can, I can imagine what, what it takes to uh, upload weekly the, on an ongoing basis uh, uh, the, the videos and always with quality sound, with quality content. Think about this. Just take your time, learn more about Vim's channel. You're always welcome to our channel um, and uh, stay tuned for more. Thank you. Thanks for having me.